All right. <laughs> Looking at a lovely, lovely blank, blank page. But this is Ouija, Ouija.io for those who haven't seen it before. This is where we will be. I'll be building on all the location stuff we come up with. I was trying to figure out a way to get the PDF and the screen and that screen on at the same time. And it was just, it was just a bore and impossible. So while this is looking blank, actually, I guess I'll go fill something in right now. Just to get it going. We will, all right, we'll call this location one. So I did not kickstart Tome of Adventure Design, which I suppose maybe I should have simply because I could have gotten a hard, a uh, hardback. I don't know, physical printing. I'm sure at some point we'll be able to buy physical printings, but as of now, they're unavailable. And, but I have the PDF. Now the PDF is fine. It's a lot. Sometimes I find one of the drawbacks of PDFs, digital documents, maybe in general, as we see them, is you don't have that you know, ability to kind of pull, quickly bookmark things and do it. I'm sure there are ways to, but it just, for me anyway, never feels as good, never feels as easy as it does with a physical book. Christopher says you can still pre-order the physical books, they think. Okay, I, I will check that up, Christopher. I had not, uh, hadn't seen that, but if you can, you can. If you have the PDF and you'd like to follow along as we do this, I'm on page 18, which is the locations chapter. Looking at approach one, and it says, so I'll read the, what they have here. We've got approach one, has two tables. The text says tables 1-1a and 1-1b are simply simply alternatives for each other. They provide an overall description of the location and something slash someone that either currently occupies the location or that once gave the location its name but is not necessarily still there. Roll independently for each column on the table. The table requires four rolls of D100, not just one. And what we're looking at here to describe the tables, we have a, it is uh, five columns, one column showing which die results. And then the four columns are the description, the structure, the structure description, the structure feature, first word, feature, second word. So second word. So let's just, uh, let me just type that into our, our list here. So I got to make up, let's say I need four, we need four items, right? It looks like they've changed things up here a little bit, I think, maybe. Okay. Yeah, it looks a little bit different. Maybe we've gotten a little, did we get a, uh, a Ouija update? Maybe. So this is the structure description. This is the structure. We have here, let's see, it's called feature, first word, feature, second word. Oops, you guys can't see this, but I'm dithering between windows. Feature, first word. Uh, can you help me? No, not you, you. Feature, second word. All right, with that. Wonderful stuff out of the way. I'm rolling a D100 here using my, what are these? These are the VHS dice from 1985 games. Lovely. And using my Lego Yahtzee little mini dice tower here. I've got it angled so it should not fly off my desk. Roll number one, 93. It's a high number. 93 gives us for the construction and this table is three four pages long treasure treasure dash i'm just gonna write it down as it as it comes take it as it comes and i have not pre-done any of this stuff and of course i haven't really pre my first time really getting into it so we have treasure how it is that's how it is in the books that's how i'm gonna keep it I got another another few dice rolls here. So the next one, I've got a 44. For some reason, I remember that last stream. I feel like I was rolling in the 40s all the time. It's called Boundary of the. So we're getting some pieces here. Boundary of the. Dot, dot, dot. 
It might be that this would then be Treasure Foundry. I don't know. We'll see. Once we get once we get all the things in here, we'll see how we're gonna put it together. That might be that might be the safest bet. So that's that was our that was the second column. Now for the third column, seventy five moth dash. This is intriguing. Get moth dash raw. I'm gonna be super pleased. I don't know what the odds of that are, but I'll take it. 28 on the last final column of this table gives us the crafter. Interesting. Oh. So would that give us what would that mean so is this actually i should probably call this location table one but it seems like the output would be treasure foundry of the moth crafter That sounds cool. Michael Fraker trying to ask Krista. It's called uh, Ouija.io. I actually said it a minute ago, Michael Fraker, but that's all right. I'm taking to saying it pretty much every every stream since it comes up. Ouija.io. W-E-J-E.io. I really, they really need to get some kind of program so I could I could profit from sending folks that way. It is it is it is very nice. Uh, it, it's there. It's one of I think there are multiple different versions of this kind of whiteboard but i like it i like it okay treasury treasure foundry of the moth crafter that's our table one. Oh, nope, that was actually not what i wanted got the wrong thing destroy that get another list now that was table one one a we've also got a different one, right? I don't think we need to do both of these, right? I think that was the idea, as they said, the front, we just do, they're alternates, alternates, right? So we don't need to do two. So we did, so we're, did one, one dash one A, here we have one dash one B, so that's fine. So as we were told, we already did one, so we can skip it. I wonder why they, I guess because they just wanted to have two 100s, but I wonder, this is where I wonder if doing it in, uh, I forget the kind of table, what do they call it? Uh, where you have two multiple items in one option. I forget there's a, there's a name for it. I'm spacing out the name that someone came, that uh, was pioneered. Was it Into the Odd did that first or, or not first, but anyway, this concept of having kind of multiple options in one table, which, cause it seems like these maybe are divided so that you, they need to have, they have 200, but we only they only you know highest numbers we have to roll are, are D one hundred so they're doing it one to one hundred twice. But then you can't have any mixture between the tables. I suppose you could, but it's it would be easier if you just maybe had something where you could have more values in there. Oh, you know what? I'm going to write Ouija.io in the chat too. So that Michael Fraker and others. Now, so, okay, we got some example results. These are good starting points for the development of an adventure, enough at least to start putting your mind into gear. You might end up with a location that's completely different from your initial starting point once all the pieces have fallen into place, been arranged, and been polished. But then the, that's the nature of the creative process. Getting it, is, getting it started is often the hardest step. So now they have a give us a second approach, which is... Again, an alternative not to be used in conjunction with tables 1A, 1-1A, or 1-1B. As they say here in the text above this one, it is an alternative approach to generate to generating seeds for an adventure location. The tables focus more on the purpose of the location than upon its past or present occupants. This table requires much more creative thinking than 1-1A one, one, one or 1-1B because many results will be quite bizarre at first glance. This is deliberate without strange conjunctions. Tables don't yield creative results. So 
This one is, again, it's another D100 table, and it basically has two location contents. So you would, you would, and again, it's divided into word one and word two. So for example, if we rolled a one and then a 24, you would get the ancestral disc. It seems like you could do this in conjunction with the other one. I'm going to, let's get it in here. I, I know, I know that they're saying, don't do it. Don't put them together. I'm putting them together. I want to know about something that's in here. We got 55 for word one. That's a memory. Memory. 38. Memory Harbor. So like they say, we're going to get some weird results, but I'm taking it. I'm taking it anyway. Which table is this? This is table 1-2, Memory Harbor. This was, I guess we should be specific. Okay. A memory arbor. Christopher says, would it be possible to show some of the tables in the PDF as you use them? It's just difficult, Christopher, because I can try. The problem is, let's see. I, let me see if I can get this to work. I, I was looking at it before, and it just, just just a bit outside it was uh let's see hold on okay i got acrobat here i think already and that works all right here we go hard in my mess oops that's not what i wanted to do See, how's that? Not perfect. Small. Does that work? There we go. I got to figure out how to make some nicer. I need who's who's someone hook me up with someone someone. <laughs> if you know somebody who is good at doing these sort of templates for OBS and other things, would love to talk to them. I could probably use a few different templates to make things a little bit prettier than just these kind of crappy boxes and stuff. But hopefully this will suit. I move that up slightly. You know what? Maybe I need to pull that down. Then we move it. Up. Okay. I'm gonna spend. See, this is what happens. I am spending all kinds of time tweaking, tweaking my thing. All right. I'm gonna leave it there. Does that look okay? Hey, Red Caps. Thanks for hanging out. Well, that's where I am. Okay. So I did. So we did table one dash two. We got, I'm going to make, I got to move my things over so you can see we got Memory Harbor. Stop moving that. Yeah, all right, we got the, even though we're not supposed to do it, I'm doing it anyway. We've got, a, we weren't really supposed to, we were instructed not to mix, mix and match our tables or our approaches, I guess I should say, but I'm doing it anyway. We got a memory harbor. We can figure out what that means. There's more locations, more locations. Most, uh, most of the chapters dealing with specific adventure locales also contain shorter, more specific tables for generating generating locations in that terrain type. So I guess the in interesting thing here is that interesting thing here is this is really the end of the chapter. So you just get. I was kind of hoping because I haven't pre-done this. This is none of this is pre-planned as usual. 
I was sort of hoping that this locations chapter would maybe give us a bit more than just these, but we'll have to see. We'll have to see as we go. What do we get next out of the tomb? Because I, I, my idea for this whole stream was to work on locations. So I don't want to, I don't, I don't, I'm going to try to jump around to the things that are location based as opposed to others, but maybe, maybe some of these missions stuff will, will tell us it's, it is interesting to see how they organize things in terms of how they want you to do it. So here clearly conceptually what the to the tome is telling us to do is here, here's some tidbits about our location, very little. And then perhaps now we're going to build the rest of it as we build what our adventure idea is in this location. Let's see. Let's see. Because it's not, it's, I don't know if that's quite how I would do it myself, just my own workflow. But of course, I, I don't, I, well, I'm not going to pretend that my workflow is somehow super efficient or this is the way you need to do it. Like, probably not the way you need to do it. And um, Here's a swig of watered down apple cider for the working man. Okay, into missions. If you're following along at home, we're on page 28 of the Tome Adventure Design. I'm going to try to concentrate on not getting too far afield from working on our locations, or in this case, we have maybe one location, but we'll see. We'll see where the book takes us. And I might need my glasses. Actually, no, I think I'm okay. Another starting approach to adventure design is start with the mission facing the players and see what interesting ideas crop up about locations or villains. This table isn't about generating missions that characters are forced to undertake in a particular way. Rather, it's a way to jumpstart your creativity into coming up with a more complex adventure scenario the players might approach in a multitude of different ways. So the idea here, so, so really this isn't in conjunction with the locations. It's basically saying, here's an alternate idea. So one idea for starting your adventure, because remember this is the tome of adventure design, is to take a location, how do, how do you feel about that location? Does it speak to you? Does it drive your creativity? And then you follow that along until you have a location and then maybe you generate some stuff about it and you come up with all kinds of stuff. And then, then you can come up from that location once you've sort of fleshed it out. You figure out how an adventure might get you to that location or how that event, how that location becomes the subject or object of an adventure. And I think... That, that's very similar to what we did with the DMG last week when we spent a couple of days building up this dungeon. We went with the dungeon first and started seeing how these elements that the DMG was providing us through through its random tables gave us, and then we could kind of piece it together and come up with, oh, okay, now I can see how an adventure develops out of the location. Tome is saying, okay, you can go location first, which is what we saw in those other tables, or you can go some kind of adventure seed first and then see how that might lead you to locations or whatnot. So I'm not going to roll these tables because we're not doing the missions. I want to do locations. But since we're here, we got some tables that talk about the a type of mission, which is about a person, basically a person, place, or thing, or an event. And then we have tables for each one of those. So an individual-based mission might be to bribe or negotiate with somebody, entrap or sting somebody, extort from somebody, find somebody who's missing, so on and so forth. Item-based missions might be that you need to attack to attack someone to obtain something, fake the existence of something, find or locate something, guard or protect something, so on and so forth. And that they do, you can see here, they are referencing other tables. Either. And then we get similar tables for location-based missions and event-based missions. Event-based missions are kind of interesting. Just conceptually, but you get stuff like expose someone involved in something, for example, a cattle drive, or hide evidence of what really happened in a recent disruption of a ceremony kind of thing. So they're not so much, it's interesting because the event is, seems like something that's happened in the past that, that the, this is tying into, because some of these expose someone involved in could also be a person individual based mission but here maybe we're saying that it's because it's around the event that really the thing that's i don't know the 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 fun or or whatever is about is about the event but it's interesting because the events already happened i almost wonder if these should be some of them seem to be happening in the present such as escape from and then there's say arena or gladiatorial 
battles. That one seems more like it's happening kind of in the moment, where some of them, it's a recent thing, so it's a thing that passed. I would think they did it, it, the, for me, if I was going to do something event-based, I would really want to look at the ones that, this is what's happening now. If you think of all those movies where, in which something's happening or, a, or, or preparation is taking place and you know something bad is going to happen or someone's told you, you received a clue or a message or something saying, you know, I'm going to attack the king at the coronation so that everything kind of converges on that event, which is a little bit different than something happened during the coronation and now you're kind of cleaning it up afterwards. Does that make sense? So they, they both kind of concern the event, but one of them, the, the, the event is much more the, the focus, I would think. And we have some tables for getting uh, for patrons or targets, probably depending on what you've rolled on those other tables. So, you know, abbots, addicts, adventurers, agents, so on and so forth. You got a whole bunch more of those. What do you do when you're getting up past the 100s? Oh, it's a D1000. I'm not sure how one rolls a D1000. Is that just three D10s? That'd be right, 3D10s? I, I imagine that would be. So keep going, keep going. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling along. Almost there. And we get a table of motivations. This could be easily repurposed for lots of other things. Cause dishonor for a business partner. Protect the wealth of a spiritual leader. Revenge upon or behalf of, on behalf of a spouse. Those are all good. Now we get some hooks. What might motivate motivate players to choose this adventure at the 100 table? And then another column, that's column one, is what might motivate the players to choose the adventure. And then column two is how characters learn about the opportunity. So one of them would be the ability to move inconspicuously in certain groups or places might be the motivation. How they learn about it is a person offers to trade information about the opportunity in exchange for money. <laughs> Chris, they're giving some... Creedence Clearwater Revival, scrolling, scrolling down the river. Very good. And we got a whole bunch of those, which are great. All right, now we get the villain's plan. The following tables can be used to get ideas for an adventure, starting with some details about the villain's plan. The plan need not be immediately obvious at the start of the adventure. It might not even be discovered until the very end. Note that this section has a master table, which directs the reader to one of the tables other tables, basically. Table, the last table, maybe? Stands alone, since it can apply to virtually all the other tables. So we're going to roll on these ones, because, hey, let's find out who is, who is, uh, I don't know who's running, or maybe who is, who might be opposing the party in regards to the treasure foundry of the Moth Crafter. But let's figure this one out. I'm rolling my D100 again. And I think I did a pretty good job, because none of my dice fell off the table this time around. So that's a plus. That's another thing I need. If somebody knows, somebody who does, somebody knows. What do I keep doing? If someone, if you, dear reader, reader, dear, dear listener, dear viewer, know someone who does dice trays, it's something else I need to work on. Since I plan to do more stuff where I might actually show a dice tray on the screen, I'd love to have one. I can maybe customize, put my logo on, something like that. We get 11 conversion. The villain is trying to recruit others to his way of thinking. This is table 111. Master villain table 111. That was location, so now I need another list. Master villain. Table one, 11, and we got, whoops, let's do this, conversion. Stop that. Let's see. I don't need Microsoft Edge Dev Tools. I don't need you. Thank you. The villain is trying to convert others to his way of thinking as opposed to subversion, which involves using them without changing their minds. So our, we have, so that's, I, we don't really know what this is in, yeah, what, what the, uh, what is going on with this now? We 
we don't we don't know why or to what ends they're trying to do this conversion only that they're converting people hey Caverna. but we do have that so we got conversion going on that was our first table and this is the type of villainous plan actually now let me write that in there because i will forget and wonder what the heck type of villainous plan Conversion. What do we get after this? Now, the next thing we get is to concealment used as a creative tool to generate the start of adventure. This table gives some details about a villain whose highest priority at the moment is simply to hide themselves. Oh, I think so. Maybe we're supposed to go to the. So we're thinking we're maybe we're supposed to go to the conversion table. I think so. Concealment. Okay, so we don't need to roll through this one. We need to get to conversion. So now we have a table on particular conversion type plans so conversion type plans are designed to win over the hearts minds and possibly souls of the villains targets this there is another similar table later on called subversion and the distinction is that a conversion plot is designed to change the moral alignment of the target whereas a subversion plot can succeed perfectly well if the target never changes at all as long as the target keeps unknowingly working on the villain's behalf so another 100 table we got 32 and 32 tells us that, where's 32? The conversion method is hostage taking. All right, hostage taking. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say tables. I'm not gonna make a new list for each one of these. Version method is hostages. The villain takes hostages, compelling their kin or the hostages themselves to perform evil acts in exchange for freedom or good treatment. So we're starting to get an idea of how our who our villain is, what they're up to. We are going to get to scroll past all these other different types of wait, wait, hold on. Let me make sure I didn't pass. Was there any other? Uh, all conversion method, right? Or was that a different table? Yeah, conversion method. Yep, okay. That is correct. So we could go through all these. Destroy community. You see there's lots of tables, which is good. Part of the strength. Hold on, is this still? I think we're still in the same one. Or are we? Oh no, did I lose? Hold on, do we? Where's the table? Of, can I get a table of contents? All right, let's see here. We are in <laughs> Lose My Place. Master type villainous plots. And oh, all right, concluding remarks to chapter one. So that's it for chapter one. What happens here? Groups. Uh, okay. Oh, here we go. Minions. Yeah, we gotta have minions. Nature of assistance being rendered. Okay. Let me just make sure there were... The master table had random acts, support evil groups secretly. Okay, so that, that was the end of there. But then we do have to get... I do. We do need to figure out who the minions are. Gotta have minions. So, unusual minions and lieutenants. Many of the above tables involve a villain's minions. An adventure is usually improved by having some of the minions be unusual in some respect. In particular, if the villain has an interesting minion, the nature of the minion can generate some interesting ideas about the villain's plot. This might seem backward, but creating an adventure isn't always a linear process. Ideas about later parts or little details can sometimes generate fantastic ideas for adventures, for the adventure's overall structure. All right, so let's find out who is our minion. Ooh, 90. And this is a human. We got human minions here. So our 90, they are, we have to roll multiple times. Yep. All right. So we got to do, we'll need a minion 
table. We'll need a minion. Minion. Minions. And the first one is their nature, which is their thieves. Or it is a thief. I don't know if we're supposed to. Is this supposed to be like a henchman, like a number two? Or are we supposed to imagine there's more than one of these guys? So that was number one. We need an unusual characteristic. 27 gives us distinguished. Distinguished by a particular piece of clothing the minion always wears. Let's see. Right. Oh, unusual. And then reason why they're in the villain's service. 47. They're a loyal retainer pledged by honor. It's interesting. A thief that is a loyal retainer pledged by honor. Interesting. How would you stop doing that? No, thank you. Bloop. All right. Hey, Phil. Glad you could make it. We're coming up with a location, but we have gotten a little bit sidetracked coming up with our villain who has something to do with this location. We're using the Tome of Adventure Design. We got minions. We got the leader. And this is all part of Chapter 1. What's Chapter 2? Chapter 2, we're getting into monsters. I think it'll, so I, I, I'm i going to want to generate a monster. We need a, I think we'll need a monster to go in our location. I'm hoping we'll get more, be able to get more details about our actual location, but monsters is good. Uh, we could use some monsters. Could use some monsters. Let me just, uh, let me just, I know you can't see, but I've got the table. The one thing you can't see just because I had to crop things in a weird way to make things work is you got to you i've got to open up the tabs or the the bookmarks and it just shoves the window over so apologies for that we'll just start here we'll make another list for a monster this might be we could think about this maybe this is uh so we know what the main minion is but these could be creatures that are either whoops i don't i always want to do that and then i want to do a list instead Creatures that are either also in service of this villain. They could be the natural, the people who actually naturally live here. The natives, creatures who actually call this place home that maybe are a their own faction, their, their own force. We need a category. And we shall have it. Just wish I, I wished some of the navigating between some of these items in Ouija was just a bit a bit easier. We get 35. So we have a Fey. Interesting. All right. So the category is doo -doo 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 -doo. I didn't want to make you a list. No. How did I do that? I don't even know how I did that. Oh, you bummer. Stop. I like that. Add that in. Thank you. Hey. All right. What's next on our hit parade? So we're going to get all these sub tables. But I'm going to skip over beasts because we didn't get a beast. 
There's Toad. Somebody wanted, Brian Davison wanted a Toad. There's your Toad. But we didn't get Toad. We didn't get Folkloric either. What's, is Faye is separate? Because I would have kind of had Folkloric and Faye together, but I guess Folkloric is different, right? No, Folkloric doesn't actually come up on the list. Hold on. Beast, Construct, Draconic, Elemental, Faye. Giant horror, humanoid miscreature, oozes, planar plant, undead vermin. So how do you get folkloric out of that? Or is that an is that a subtable of hmm. so folkloric shape ad adaptations? The folkloric shape adaptations, quick list of ways in which myths and legends have changed the shape of normal animals into mythological and folkloric monsters. I think it's I think it's very restrictive if used as a random generation table. It sometimes be helpful as a quick generation tool. I see. Okay. Oh, Brian Davison, Tome of Adventure Design is to I got gotcha. you. I should have figured that out. Okay, we got constructs. I'm gonna skip. Can I skip here? Go back to my bookmarks. I need to get to the Fey. Here we go. Fey creatures. The concept of a fake creature is a gamer-created mishmash of virtually all folkloric creatures that don't eat humans, aren't of godlike power, and aren't significantly larger than humans, are corporeal, and are basically of a human body type. The gamer model of fake creatures relies most heavily on the she, I think that's how you pronounce it, and the we folk, mixed in with corporeal nature spirits from numerous other cultures, the nymphs and dryads of ancient Greek mythology being a prime example. These tables essentially retro-engineer the artificial category of fae by returning to the folkloric sources of the creatures commonly labeled as being in the category, drawing out resemblances and common features. That being said, there is a general set of folkloric characteristics attributed to the traditional creatures of the fae category. One, they are associated with nature in the wilderness. Two, they are difficult to find when sought. Three, most are extremely cunning, but vulnerable to trickery. Four, they show virtually no compassion for human beings. Five, they are corporeal. Six, they are frequently, but not always, associated with magical items. Seven, they are frequently associated with transformations. Eight, they are most they are almost universally absolutely forced to honor bargains. Ryan Smith says they're a bit befuddled on this particular part. So basically, what he's saying is that our concept in D D of the Fey is basically a mishmash of stuff of the kind of the the fair folk. And the we folk in basically the Celtic world, ancient Greek and potentially Roman other mythologies thrown in there, your dryads, your nymphs, which in the Greek sense had nothing to do with fae. They didn't have anything to do with, but you know, they were they were their own things that they kind of got thrust into, oh, they must be kind of fae. So what they're saying here is they they're trying to kind of take all the stuff and figure out some commonality. So when now we talk about a, a fae creature. What are the kinds of things that we're looking for? And here they're breaking it down basically into these eight assumptions, essentially. Yes, Brian Smith, there are assumptions about what it is to a fae. So imagine they had surveyed all the different creatures. They'd gone and looked in the SRD and they looked at all these different sources and they come up all these creatures that get categorized as fae over the, over the years in tabletop role playing. So they try to break it all down and say, what do they all have in common? They tend to have these things. That's where they, that's where they got this from. Now we can agree, disagree, whatever about it, but that's what they're saying. So I, I do like that they put it up front so you can read through that and see if, oh, if this is kind of what you, if this is what you see as a fake creature, then maybe these tables are appropriate. Otherwise, maybe use a different table or you could probably mix and match your tables. We're just going to go with them as is. So let's first do the form. And I got 19. Biped with animal, mammal, head, and legs. Here we go. Monster category, Fay. What are they calling that? That's form. So we got the form. Now what's next? And we, I probably have to go back to the animal, mammal. Somehow I'm going and find out some animals to put in there, but I'll do that afterwards. So here we get some more things. Remember, they had talked about how 
Pepe tend to be all about their their bargains and their deals. So we're gonna get we're gonna get we're gonna get see what kind of deals, what kind of contracts this Faye is I don't know, attracted to or what kind of things they do. Contracts here. Let's roll it up. Brian Smith says that Brian Smith says, I dig that compiled list. Even if you want your fate to be different, you have a list of things to avoid. Of course, you probably don't want to design things just to be different. Yep. Get five. Bargaining. Put that into our list here. We get bargaining, a gift is offered, souls, gems, etc., and the fake creature might or might not choose to accept the bargain. A gift is offered. So okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna think I'm thinking from this that it would be the fey creature who would offer a gift and leave it up to the pers person they're offering it to to then give a give a a, a, a I guess uh, put a price on it. So you say, oh, here's this massive gem, and the, someone, the party member, whoever they're bargaining with, would say, oh, here's a hat, or here's some gold, or here's my soul. And then the 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 creature would then determine if yeah, it's a good deal, I'll take it, or away with you, you cheap, cheapy person. Now I get magical abilities is next. The order of these is interesting, how they do the contracts before some of the more, what I would have thought was more basic stuff. Tend to pay, <laughs> prepare to pay. Pretty much. Hey, Squirrel Hermit. Home of Adventure Design is great. Yep, it seems to be. I agree. They all live in uh, they all live in Barter Town. Here we go. Magical abilities. We've gotten sixty four. They can shape shift. Easy enough. Now what what have we here? So that's and then next transformation of enemies. Oh, all right. So they got kind of an offensive transformation. I wonder what they'll transform people into. Let's see. 17. Ooh, they cause disease. Usually that's listed as a transformation. Makes sense. Oops. Oh, what is next? Characteristic Fey magic items. I'll be doing that more often. Actually, copying and pasting stuff as opposed to typing it in. Another D100 table. Fey magic items are generally musical instruments, items of clothing, or jewelry. Combs, hats, rings, and pipes are common examples. Longer lists of general possibil of general possibilities for magic items, both form and function, are included elsewhere in this compendium. These are just examples that match up well with the folklore of fake creatures. All right. And we got, what did we get here? 80, no, was that six or eight? No, that is an eight. 84. Creates a water effect to push opponents back, drown them, or or hold them. Of oh, did I find a typo? I believe I did. Why tome of adventure design? <laughs> Didn't think you had it in you. Uh, creates a water effect to push opponents, push opponents back, drown them, or hold them at bay. Water effect. That's kind of interesting. I'm I wonder if there's any any. Uh, any more information on what that would be? Is that literally water? Or is it something kind of force or air that just has a water-like motion? I suppose it's up to us to determine. 
obey methods of immobilization. We're gonna give them. We're gonna. I'm giving them all these. I'm getting all these. Maybe there won't be too many of these guys around. Cause, or the. We can obviously play with. What, the, the the rolls you might have to make to avoid such, or what might they have to roll to make it happen. <laughs> Mentioned fog machine. We got seventy. Seventy is spell like ability, gestures, and so forth causes. Enemy's hair to grow and animate entangling arms and legs. That's not it. That's not a terrible power. I like it. It kind of uh, fits with some other things we've got going on here because our our uh, our this place here is the moth, the treasury foundry, the moth crafter. I kind of think of moths and 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 sort of I feel like. Uh, Hairy things and it works. It works to me. It works. What else we have? Summoning fake creatures. Many fake creatures are subject to being summoned or called from their homes to assist the summoner. In general, some kind of bargain needs to be struck, but the bargain could potentially already exist or have been negotiated ahead of time. Since lots of these methods involve some kind of speech, the required speech might include the offered terms of the bargain but influence the success of the summoning slash calling. I definitely would love to do more in my game. It really hasn't come up, but this is kind of reminding me to do more with those things of summoning and doing bargains. And I had an opportunity to do one and I didn't really think about it. And I probably should have. I regret that I didn't. Next time I'll try to do better. 81. We get place, time, and speech. Place, time, and speech. All right, so this says offer a rhyme or a poem. I think a Faye would appreciate that. They might. They just might. So here, for this particular Faye, it's got to be, it's place, time, and speech. It might be possible to summon the Faye creature when there is a particular combination of the time, the right words, and the right place. Often a crossroads or a forest glade. Now we're on to giants, but we didn't get giants. We got Fae. So we're done, I think. I think we're done with our Fae creature. Yes, we are. We do have these other general monster tables, which I suppose we should fill in for our Fae creatures. This table, so first we have an overall combat profile. This table generates an overall combat profile for a monster regardless of type. First column addresses the monster's attack profile by identifying the body parts used for physical attacks, each body type leading to a specific subtable, and the number of special attacks the monster uses generated on the special attack subtables. Second column, which contains only a small number of actual entries, sets the number of special defenses the monster uses. In addition to special defenses, the second column sets the monster's number of distinctive attributes. Distinctive attributes can be skipped in favor of moving on to, okay, so I think we'll do it. So we need an overall, so I guess we'll do physical and special attacks for our, we're going to spend more time doing the creature than we are going to be doing the location, but that thus, that is how the how the cookie crumbles sometimes. 65. Massive table. We get a limb. I think those are the, in parentheses, I think those are the other tables we're going to have to, where we will reference. They get a lot. So they get a, a, a limb, arm. I'm guessing, or leg, some kind of body, some kind of body and a tail attack and a special attack. And that's not even including that transformation kind of attack. And now we just got to roll our specials. So this thing is, uh, maybe there might be only one of these or a few. I don't know what to say. We don't even know yet, have any idea what these would be in terms of the location, whether they'd be friendly, hostile, neutral. Who knows? Figure it out later. We 
got 85. So special defenses. No special defense. One distinctive attribute. Wah, wah, wah. Well, they didn't get lucky with the special defense. Did we get a head attack? What do we get? We got limb. Limb. Phantom limb. So here we have the, we have the table for limb attacks. 87. They have whip limb. Uh, I don't know what that is. I do not know what whip limb is, but we'll take it. I'm just going to put it off to the side here. Whip limb. We got a body attack. lot going on here picture. four adheres and dissolves digests that's kind of i can feel like moths that's sort of a mothy thing to do body and now we get a tail attack definitely getting can be kind of gross Fifty, fifty, and it fires some kind of missiles from its tail. So maybe kind of manticore-ish. And they get one special attack. Oh, there's a tongue attack. Nice. Where's the special attack? Here we go. Okay, so special attacks gets its own thing here. Here we go. 80, 88. Fighting 88. I don't know if that's, I don't remember what it was. So it's a touch. We got a touch. Why did I do that? Touch. I make this another little mini list. Attack. Delivery is through touch. Uh, attack type. That is forty three. Forty-three, forty-three, forty-three. Electrical damage, progressive. Not like those things in the casino. Not that kind of progressive. The kind that kills. What are you calling that? Oh, that's just a special attack. Okay. Okay, is there anything else about our special attack that we need to know? Again, this is a massive table. I think that, I'm going to guess, I'm going to say that's it. I don't think we have fear effects. Okay, I'm going to skip all these because I don't think we, they're just listed out here, but I'm going to guess that we would... That would be part of the profile. What is that distinctive attribute? We didn't get a special. Here we go. So we didn't get our special attribute. 53. Lucky 53. We are a special attribute for this guy. Is there a herd animal? I don't know if that. I'm going to roll again. I'm not sure that one makes sense. I don't think of moths as being herd animals. So I'm making a directorial executive decision to roll that one again. I got 11. They're blind. That one, I can see. So 
We haven't gotten any other. I don't know. I'm going to leave it in here for right now. Maybe it makes sense. Maybe it doesn't make sense. We can come back and amend it. Remember, all these things are working for us. We do not work for them. So if I don't like you, I will change you. We'll let it let it slide for right now. Let it let it ride. Okay. I want to get out of monsters. I'm gonna skipping more monsters. I want to get back to. I'm just gonna jump it up here. So we there are some chapters here. So we, there there are. Let's see. We're into part three. Dungeon design, but I'm trying to get back to stuff about the location. Not so much into the weeds on the on the the dungeon. We did. Oh, I did pass. I did miss part one here. Got elements. Races against time. Oh, that's part of the adventure. Yeah, I want to keep to the. I want to keep to the location. Let's roll some mysteries and clues. So this is why an adventure location became dangerous. Remember, we have, we have some of our location information. I'm gonna let me scroll back up so we can see it. It is the treasure foundry of the moth crafter, and it's got something. Something on the memory harbor, and if I asked if I just created a were moth, it's more of like a moth, elf moth, fey moth, but it could be a were moth. It definitely has shape shifting powers, though they're blind, which is kind of interesting. So maybe it could easily be a were moth. So I got seventy three on this roll for why the location became dangerous. Factor number one, seventy three gives us. The inhabitants broke into two groups. I need to make another list. This list is called, should be called, shall be called. Why an adventure location became. First thing we got was factor number one. Factor one, having us broken into two groups. Hey, Perkins, welcome. Except you're coming into me. I'm trying to get through this so I can. <laughs> that's already almost the hour's gone. You're just joining. I'm glad you're here for the second one, number five. In connection with an ancient curse, and then the third factor which is when it happened forty nine ten years ago. All right. Is there anything else we can do kind of quickly? I don't think so. Are there any other capsule backstories? So we have this thing called capsule backstories here. Capsule backstories aren't the story of a whole adventure location. They're smaller things that happen in parts of the adventure area, the interesting tidbits that might or might not be usable by an adventure venturing party. Use one or the other of the two tables below. They generate similar results, but use different methods for generating results. Most likely, one of the tables will connect with your subconscious better than the other. Oval Team Patrol says, I can't really demonstrate why, but I feel like moths or mothmen have kind of made inroads in, in the fantasy zeitgeist of late. Well, I'm always, I've been a fan of Mothman way back. <clears throat> big fan of the Mothman. So I'm down with it. I was also a big fan of Mothra, also growing up. So, um, I'm I'm ready. I'm ready for moth overlords. 
Bring them on. Perkins says, I hope they print enough extra copies. Yep. Hopefully they will. All right. So I'm going to skip the capsules. We do have some nice mystery stuff here. Or is that what we were already were doing? Uh, let's see. How many we don't? Types of information, clues, generating magical symbols, generating riddles, the map. Dungeon dressing is good, but it's not helpful for the location itself. You get some non dungeon design. Um, bum, bum, bum. I'm just trying to look really quick because we're at the end here. If there's anything I'm missing. Got a lot. There's so many tables. So many tables. Let me go to the. Let's go to where is the actual table of contents? So we're back here. I'm wrapping this up for now. But I just want to see if there's anything else I'm missing for a location. These are all monsters. We already did. We got our fake creatures. We got that part. We did our not doing the dungeon design right now. Some more about the location. Let's see. Oh, placing landmarks. Oh, that's inside a dungeon. Okay, so now we don't want to be inside the dungeon. Wilderness adventures, charts of uncommon ship types, unusual trees, unusual plants. General, that's general wilderness. Is that what we want? Is that what we want? But is that what they want? All right, let's just see. Let's just go here. Part one. Yeah, I'm going to roll. Let's roll. Before I wrap it up, let's roll. Perkins, asked, Perkins, I will go through. I will, I will do a summary of everything we come up with in a in a couple of minutes. Uh, let me just see if we can get some unusual trees. Forty, forty nets us trees that have eyes or seem to. Ooh, that I like that one because the moth, the moth people are blind. The trees have eyes. The trees have eyes. What else have we got? But can the trees here, Frederick asks. That's a good question. Maybe the moth folk here, the trees see. They, it's a, you know, see no, see no evil, hear no evil. Everybody, everybody benefits. Well, I've gotten a couple of double zeros, but no, no double zero than zero. So this one, I got five. As usual, plants. Oh, we got berries. 64 berries that are that have minor healing properties. All right. I'm down with that. I am down with some minor healing berries. I'm just going to call this terrain. Berries, mild healing properties, some animals. Let's see if we get something cool. Animals, 65. Sick, rabid, or diseased animals. We'll have to figure out, at some point, we'll figure out why that is. But for now, make a note. Animal wounds. Okay, we don't need wounds because they're they're sick. All right, now we get some weird terrain features. Hold the control asks if a tree falls in the woods, the moths hear it. Absolutely, but they don't see it, but they hear it. Uh, one got stuck in the pipe. 
47. So our weird terrain feature is a rock formation. What is weird about this rock formation? Oh, uh, what is that? Got impossible geometry or obvious dimensional strangeness. I rolled a 33. Now, oh, what else we got? Caravans or cargo. I don't want any caravans or cargo. I'm not interested in caravans or cargo. So thank you. No, thank you. Anything else? Didn't roll for. Interesting that we didn't get a. Uh, I don't know where we'd roll for what the actual hex, like what the overall brain is, but we, we got trees, and so I'm going to go with forest mapping. Let's see. So this is. So it's a forest. 91. Oh, forest with rivers, creeks, and brooks. All right. That's. Fine. Rivers, creeks, brooks. I kind of think that the in unusual rock formations might be in between all these waterways, which sounds kind of cool to me anyway. And then forest dressing I got with 15. <clears throat> A broken woodman's axe. Okay, this one. It's like a weird. It's almost too specific. Or I was thinking we get more general stuff, but this is that's very like oh you're and they're clearing and there's a broken wood axe. Well, let's get to the legends. Legend of Billy Jean or fifty two, the shadowy. The shadowy 43. The shadowy knight. Uh, I'm going to roll that one again. Ah, it just seems kind, of, seems kind of cheesy. The shadowy glade. All right. The shadowy glade. Uh, okay. Sure. The shadowy glade. Not my favorite. I'm not going to roll on here all day. Hey, Gashrin. Frederick says the moths, the moths ruin the character's clothes, cloaks, and armor. They're kind of big moths, but yeah. <laughs> if, they, if, they got a hold, if they got a hold of your armor, your clothes, they probably could very well ruin it. And then we'll roll for some, what the kind of, what animal. I suppose I could roll it more than once, but here we go. 65. We've got small snakes, and I'll roll one more. 54. Small snakes and skunks. That's an interesting combination. Small snakes, skunks. <laughs> uh, definitely seems funny. All right. So we got to wrap this bad boy up. Krista says, moths are to robe wizards what rust monst monsters are to armored warriors. That's Now, that's intriguing that they are all about, like, eating magic stuff. Their robes, their spell books. Rolls, some interesting stuff. All right, so let's wrap this bad boy up in terms of what we got here. This is the first time I've gone through the tone of adventure design. It definitely has an interesting lay interesting layout. I don't know that I love it. it. I don't know that it all made sense to me in the flow, but I got to read through it. I think that's also where having a physical book in front of me instead of the PDF would probably help a lot because it looks like it's giving you sort of different ways of designing your adventure in kind of chunks. And it and and at least the flow didn't quite match up with the flow that I'm trying to imprint on it, or I'm trying to bring to the tables, trying to guide me maybe a little bit differently. So that's interesting. I definitely need need and want to play around more with it. But there's no question there is a a gazillion amount of options here in terms of what you can do. So what we came up with in our a little bit over an hour here is a place called the Treasure Foundry of the Moth Crafter that has something we have not gotten to determine what this is something that is called a memory harbor it's in a foresty terrain the, tr the trees seem to have eyes here 
and berries grow that have minor healing properties, the animals tend to be sick, rabid, or diseased. There are rock formations with strange geometries. The forest is littered with look, rivers, creeks, and brooks. Somewhere near here, there's a broken woodman's axe. There's a legend that talks about this place and calls it the shadowy glade, and it's filled with small snakes and skunks. Maybe filled with, but the main creatures that exist here outside of this fey creatures who are a biped. Oh, we never looked up. They have their bipedal, bipedal with uh, some kind of animal head and legs. We should roll on those, but maybe I would use skunk. They, they, uh, they like to bargain. They will offer a gift in exchange for something. They have the ability to shape shift. They cause disease. So that makes sense that we have all kinds of terrain. We got all those animals here that are sickly. They, uh, they like to create a water effect, which also makes sense given all these creeks. So that's another thing that we can, it's nice when we get these synergies that uh, push opponents back, drown them, or hold them at bay. And they have a, a, a spell-like ability to, that causes enemies' hair to grow and animate, entangling them. You can summon them if you're, in the, if you're in the right place at the right time and you know the right things to say. They've got a wimp whip limb attack. They can adhere to you and dissolve slash digest you. And they have some kind of, they able to fire some kind of missile from their tails, which they have. They also have a special touch attack that does progressive electrical damage. They are blind. So there's that. Now, the villain, who we don't know. We have no idea if the villain is one of the Fae, these Fae, or is someone else working against the Fae. We don't know the relationship yet, but we do have a villain whose plan is to convert others to their way of thinking, and they do this by the keeping of hostages. Presumably, this seems like this hostage method probably fits in with the Fae. Maybe he's holding them hostage. Doing something like that, that makes sense. He has a minion. Maybe his number two, or their number two, is a thief who is distinguished by some piece of clothing they wear, which we haven't determined yet, and why they serve is they're loyal. They, they are pledged by honor that they are, are holding on to. So pretty good stuff. Pretty good stuff. Uh, there's, it, it definitely is interesting in the amount of tables and things that they give. I would have liked some more in the location aspect. I felt like there's we had we left some stuff on the table here in terms of what we maybe we could have learned about the location, but we didn't get into the dungeon stuff, and maybe that's where we would get into the dungeon tables, and the dungeon tables would help us flesh out that a little bit more. I'll look at it maybe next time we'll we'll get in there. Perkins says originally it was separate books, and that kind of makes I can see the that making sense. But I think having so I just would say okay, originally there were separate books, and I think that's clear because you have these different approaches that basically stop and then it's like here take this other approach but that being said it's not necessarily a bad thing but you, you put them together maybe we could do a little bit of work to integrate them a little bit more but i think what they're giving you is here's approach a b c and you could pick which approach works for you or some combination thereof i i just think that just with the with the digital pdf and again this is my first time using it so it also much just might be that i'm not used to it and i don't get it yet and I just haven't figured out how to navigate it yet. Like I said, I would like more of the locations. I did have to kind of bounce around a bit, but that's me with my workflow. Maybe somewhere in the introduction or somewhere at the front, it gets into here's our workflow. Here's how we suggest you do the workflow, and then you can do that. But because it was going from kind of approach to approach to approach, it didn't seem like you could go through and do everything at once because you get to the end of one and all of a sudden saying, oh, here's another way to do what you already did theoretically. So. It's neither here nor there. It's just kind of how they're organizing it, how they're presenting it. Um, I think it's gonna. I think it's a book that you're gonna have to get used to figuring out a little bit. But on the other side of it, it's just got a ton of tables. You can always just jump to a particular table and use it. Grab stuff from one table, throw it in another table. Cool stuff. So I'm really glad I got to do this. It's an interesting location. I'm not sure what we'll do it. If you see this location and you think, "Oh, I have an idea what to do with it," let me know. Go on the forums. Forums.hex.press. Perkins and I have been talking about their solo gaming. Uh, which has been really interesting. I will, I'll, I'll probably try to get this into some kind of document. I'll throw it on the forums too, so folks want to look at it and comment, they can. But I hope this gave a run through about at least some way of using the Tome of Adventure Design from someone who's not at all an expert at it, but just looking at it the first time, as you might be if you're getting your Kickstarter copy in or you have your PDF. And there is a link in the show description. You can buy the PDF on drive through. 
So there's probably it's probably available other places, but I have the drive through link if you're interested there. Check that out. Uh, let's see. Brian Davidson says it takes some time to get a feel for it. Take uh, take care. I missed the fish from the background. <laughs> I'm not sure what the fish from the background is, Brian Davidson. But and then uh, the K5K says there's so much content it's easy to get lost. You should probably pick an approach: location based, monster based, hook approach, adventure type, etc. Do that, and it works. Yep, I think that's a big thing, right? I think I was trying to do an, a specific thing, which was flesh out a location, and it's trying to give me a whole adventure and doing it in a particular way. So what I'll probably do, and let me know how you folks want in the here in the chat for the next minute or two, or in the comments of if there's one of those approaches you're more interested in than the others, we can kind of try to go down those paths and be a bit more, a bit more targeted. But I think it is a good to see it this way because this is a use case where you come to it with a specific thing. I need a location. And then you're trying to figure out how to get that out of the book. So anyhow, anyhow, in any pro, in, in any event, really fun, fun exercise. I got to run. So guys, have a great rest of your day, night, whenever you end up watching or listening to this. If you could give a thumbs up on your way out, that would be awesome. If you feel like subscribing, that would also be awesome. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day, night, whenever you end up watching or listening to this. Let me give you another salute. Game on. I will talk to you later. Bye now.